graciously decided to come speak to us. I think everyone's pretty familiar with Michelle, but uh, she owns a shop out at Lake George, and she's going to talk to us about fishing in South Park. Thank you, John, and thank you all for inviting me to be here. I'm thrilled to be here. What a fantastic chapter this is. Your accomplishments are they're astounding. Besides owning the um, Tumbling Trout Fly Shop in Lake George, going into my 10th year next year, I'm also the Vice President of Financial Development for the Pikes Peak Chapter of Trout Unlimited. So I'm very conservation oriented and I appreciate being here tonight. There's, I see a lot of talent in here, oh my. Lots of talent and um, some friends that have helped me along the way for at least 10 years along the way being a fly shop owner. So the talk tonight is on reservoirs, not streamers, not river fishing, not 11 mile canyon, not Phil Iwane's no mercy mid. Reservoirs and why you might want to fish them. Did you know there are seven reservoirs in South Park? There's actually eight reservoirs in, in South Park. Anybody think they can take a stab at naming the seven reservoirs? Okay, you don't have to take a stab. I'm obviously gonna point them out. Um, let's first just highlight it. Has everybody here been to South Park, Colorado? So it's a big, wide open valley. It's nine elevation at the bottom. It's bound by mountains on the east and the west. Geologically, it's part of a rift system that has started down the San Luis Valley. It actually starts down in New Mexico, and the mountains are pulling apart, and these basins are opening up. It's opening up in South Park, it's opening up in Middle Park, it's opening up in North Park. And as the um, mountains pull apart, they pop up. The Arkansas River used to flow down the middle of South Park until the mountains popped up on the west side. I'm going to back it to the mountains popped up on the west side and that divided the drainage between the headwaters of the South Platte and the Arkansas River. Just point being, it's a really high alpine valley. It's behind the Front Range. Here's Colorado Springs. If you're driving west to like to go skiing, who slides down the mountain fast when you can be skiing? I mean, fishing. All right. Um, the, head, the whole headwaters of the South Platte start in the South Park Basin. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in Aurora. And I used to play the symphony. I played the bassoon. We used to go downtown Denver. And I saw this. This is in high school. I used to see the river down there. And, I learned it was the South Platte. And then when I got married later in Victor, Colorado, my husband would take me to 11 Mile Canyon and he said, that's the South Platte. And it was flowing north. And he would took me to Dreamstream. He said, this is the Dreamstream, it's the South Platte. It was flowing south. None of this made any sense to me. Then he took me out to Lake McConaughey and he said, this is the Platte River, the north and the south. Come to a confluence out here. We're out seeing uh, Cabela's back when there's one Cabela's because we'd go out there to pheasant hunt or fish the tailwaters below Lake McConaughey, not Lake McConaughey itself. And eventually, I'm a geologist, I learned that the headwater starts in South Park and it hits 11 Mile Canyon, which is a geologic fault, and it turns north. And it heads north through Wildcat Canyon, Cheeseman Reservoir, Waterton Canyon, Chatfield, and it flows through downtown Denver. And it goes on out and it has confluences out by where the original Cabela's was. Flat River flows through Nebraska and meets up with the Missouri. I knew the Missouri River from West Montana, Craig. There's a nice little bar, Joe's Bar in Craig, Montana. Then it flows down the Mississippi River. This is all flowing into the Atlantic. Keep that in mind because we'll talk about that again in a little while. South Park. The major tributaries of the South Platte that are in South Park are the South Fork of the South Platte. The middle fork of the South Flat, their confluence is above Spinney, Terriol Creek, and Lost Creek. North Fork is along 285, and its confluence is down by um, the South Platte Hotel, if you know the road that goes back or Foxton Road. But point being, all these little creeks that flow out of the mountains are feeding. Some of them are spring fed. They're constantly flowing, even like right now when it's real warm and the waters down in South Park are getting scant and warm. You can go up in the high country and still have some nice flow in the little creeks because they're mostly spring fed, not just snow melt. 
And um, in South Park in the basin, this is a big mountain range called the Mosquito Mountains. Along the base, the water of the aquifer in the mountains expresses at the surface as springs it has since the Pleistocene. And there are some Pleistocene age bogs called fins, F-E-N-S, which are protected because they have grasses, trees, and in some cases, insects that date back to the Pleistocene that exist nowhere else on our planet. They are globally unique, including a particular caddis species that's at the High Creek Fin. I'm just mentioning that because South Park has a lot of water flowing all the time. Most of the springs are on private land and private ranches because when Manifest Destiny people came homesteads, they had to build where there was free flowing water. So these days, public access is pretty limited, mostly on creeks and rivers and through state wildlife programs. The springs themselves are constantly feeding these rivers and they're mostly on um, private lands. I'm gonna be talking about the seven reservoirs. The first one is 11 mile reservoir. Y'all heard of that one. I'm sure I'm not blocking you. I'm gonna stand over here. Hey, y'all, I'm back here. The second one is spinning. Oh, I lost. This guy's head blocks my microphone. It's like, holy oh, moly. I hope he doesn't have a pager in his pocket. The third is on Taro. In, come on, take a stab at the fourth. Terriol Reservoir, right? Now you, now you can't think of any others. I know you can't. Fair Play Beach is a reservoir on the Middle Fork. All these reservoirs have a river that flows into them, a little dam, and a river that flows out of them. Montgomery Reservoir. How could you forget Montgomery Reservoir? Come on, the seventh one. Come on. Jefferson Reservoir. That's right. Those are the seven public fly fishable reservoirs in South Park. Anytime you're near a reservoir, you should be thinking about, well, are the headwaters fishable? I mean, we all have family wants to go to a reservoir and they want to sit in a chair and they want to use bait and they want to kill fish. And if you're there with your family, you should ask yourself, what's the headwaters like that flows into this reservoir? Does the water flow out of the bottom of the dam or the top of the dam? Because you might have a good tailwater somewhere. If you're trapped alive in Kansas visiting somebody, there's a reservoir nearby, just Look out for yourself. Look it up. Does the water flow out the bottom? If it does, it's a tailwater. It's flowing out the bottom, keeping the same temperature year round. Probably has some trout in it. So always think headwaters and tailwaters when you're trapped alive in a reservoir. When you go into a reservoir and you're going to fish a reservoir, where do you start? Of course, there's banks and there's water. How do you know where to start? Well, first, you better decide if you're with people who are going to keep the fish or with people who's gonna let the fish go. If there's wild fish in that reservoir, of course, we're gonna be releasing them. If you're with people who wanna keep fish, go to a place where your tax dollars and your fishing licenses are paying to stock fish so that your little kids, whoever you're with can keep a fish. There's nothing wrong with keeping a fish and that's what your money's paying for. But you certainly should go someplace. Like this is my 92 year old mother. She feels jipped if she has not got a platter full of rainbows. But you know that feeling you get when you release a beautiful fish, am I right? Actually, sometimes my mom, these days when I take my mom fishing, she can hardly walk. And so I got to carry, she's got one of those lawn chairs that has the thing that goes over the top of your head. That folds up. And I got her little six-pack cooler, has her margaritas in it. She's got a tackle box. It's real little. It has her worms in it and a worm threader. I got her poodle on a retractable leash and a pillow. And I'm carrying all this stuff down plus her, her fishing rod. And she's going to want to catch fish. And I'm the one who has to, because she, at this point in her life, God bless her. That's a Texas thing you say, God bless them. She catches a fish and she reels backwards and you just get a hairball in her zebco, you know, so I have to grab that rod and have to pull this fish up on the shore hand over. And then um, if it's a really nice looking fish, I'll just let it go. If it looks like I can let it go without it, like if it swallowed a hook, we're gonna. And sometimes she says to me, well, I caught seven fish. I, no, you didn't catch seven fish. Yeah, I, I caught seven fish. No, mom, you didn't catch seven fish. So when you're in a reservoir, there are different ways that you fish a reservoir. You can wade fish it. 
there in a boat, you can sit in a chair. And all of these things are pleasurable to do. And some reservoirs are better at this than others. There are some reservoirs that are really not very good approachable unless you're out there in the water at least 30 feet off the bank. So another thing you need to know about reservoirs versus rivers, and I am keyed into rivers, I understand fish hanging out. Phil and I have talked about that a lot. We talk about different species and how they hang out on their sofa, watch TV, eat popcorn. The river brings food to a trout. It has its home, but the reservoir is not moving. The trout move around in groups. It's like this way they call them schools of fish because it's a school bus. It's going around the lake. Everybody's catching fish and then nobody's catching fish because the school, the school just came through. So there's some things about the reservoir you need to know, and that is how their food is growing. And there's these different levels in lakes, especially when they're deep. And they have, I don't know if anybody's here old enough to remember Jell-O 1, 2, 3. Please, somebody, do you remember Jell-O 1, 2, 3? No. Anyway, it used to be this Jell-O that uh, you could make with layers, and they were like different colors, impermeable. So lakes are like that, and these different uh, stratigraphic layers in lakes, some of them are actually impermeable. They have their own uh, circulation in these zones. And some of them, the sunlight, and they have more oxygen. And then there are other layers that are colder. And the very bottom layer, which is the coldest, is actually anaerobic. If you go really deep, there's just decaying things. And those kind of bacteria consume oxygen and expel sulfur that makes sulfur dioxide and it becomes an anaerobic environment, no oxygen, nothing growing down there. So you actually cannot go forever deep in a lake or you will penetrate to where there's no fish, no fish anyway. So um, oxygenation and temperature are very driven. I'm gonna talk about science for a minute. Science, dude's your favorite subject, right? Right? We know about um, molecules. So oxygen molecules, now, if you have tea and you get a spoonful of sugar, you can see the sugar and you can pour it in the tea. If you stir it up, you cannot see that sugar anymore because it is in a dissolved state. But the sugar, the iced tea is sweet. The same with oxygen. It's not going to be bubbles. When it's dissolved in solution, it's more, um, it can be absorbed more kinetically through the gills of a trout. Cold water holds more oxygen because these molecules are not very excited. You can get more of them together in a box. More of them can fit in an elevator. When the water is warm, the oxygen molecules are more excited. They bump each other around, they become liberated. They actually go out the surface of the water, they're, they're, uh, it's, they're evaporated. And so warm water does not hold as much dissolved oxygen as cold water. All right, I'm done. This guy's done with the science over here. I can tell right that. Zap right in his head, okay. So there's a layer here. This impermeable layer is like the, a rubber a rubber layer that's, um, even though the temperature goes down with depth, the oxygen in this layer is not going to be dissolved anymore. We're getting to um, depth is what I was, temperature and depth is important, but also the sun can only penetrate so deeply. There's no plants growing out here because there's no dirt. Where, there's no dirt where the sun can reach it. So the plants are only going to grow in shallow shelves where the sun can reach the dirt. And the plants are hosting the insects. So the insects are where the plants are. Is another reason that you, when you approach a reservoir, you're going to be going, all right, now I'm going to go to a shallow shelf and look for the plants. Because that's where the insects are. The wind. So the wind whips... And, and makes these different impermeable surfaces kind of flippy floppy. And eventually, like in the spring and late in the summer, the cold water at the bottom and the top change and they flip over and then some lakes, and if you know people from Minnesota, they know all about this, when the lake turns over. I'm from Colorado, we don't know about lakes turning over. When they turn over, they're real, real stinky. And you have this um, anaerobic toxic gases are now on the top. And fish are not feeding, and that's why dissolved oxygen has to start all over. Another thing that happens with the wind is all these insects that are over here, they're emerging. They're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. they make sounds like that, too. I do know that. They concentrate on the 
forward side, leeward, windward. They concentrate where the wind is blowing them. So now you're going to approach a reservoir because we have science. You're on the shallow place. Look where the weeds are. Insects are there. But put your finger in the air like the pirate. Ah, wind's blowing that way. If you're on the United States continent, wind is probably blowing from the west to the east. It's a phenomenon of this planet. So probably the east side in most reservoirs, especially out in the open like South Park, is going to have more insects, especially emerging insects and cripples. We have another phenomenon that happens in the mountains. It's one of the reasons South Park is so arid. Ten, less than 10 inches a year precipitation. That is desert conditions. And that's because the wet moisture hits the Rocky Mountains, drops rain, drops snow. Now it's super dry. It hits the mountain. It changes temperatures. And when it blows across South Park, it's sucking any moisture out of the air, off the ground. That's why South Park is so dry. It doesn't, the snow doesn't accumulate there. It ablates. It evaporates faster than it melts because the moisture is going into the air. But a phenomenon about being in a reservoir in South Park is you will have in the afternoon, this warm air hits the mountain. It creates a front. You'll have a shower in the late afternoon. Everybody leaves because thunder and lightning, tornadoes, very frightening. But after they're gone, it's really calm and nice in the late afternoon. So if you're fishing reservoirs in the wide open places like South Park or maybe Nebraska, I don't know, they don't have any mountains out there, but after the storms is a really great time to fish a reservoir. So we're going to start with 11 mile reservoir and look specifically of how you might fish that. Um, if you're not familiar with 11 mile reservoir, it feeds into 11 mile canyon where y'all like to fish. This is the geologic fault that turns north. There's some islands in there. This side is really shallow and it's on the east. So this is where there's a lot of weeds, shallow. It's very rocky down here. Um, this, I've for each reservoir, I try to put things in it that and mark according to Michelle's schedule of what's important. This is what I think is important. Does it have a good headwaters? Does it have a good tailwaters? And these are things about reservoirs you might consider. And 11 mile reservoir just about covers everything. It's this is the shallow rocky point. You can just cast off here and catch big rainbows. There's a lot of bizarre and strange fish. There's a kokanee salmon, carp, grass carp, rainbows, cut bows, brown trout, no brookies. 11 mile reservoir just about has it all. Now this is a campground 11 mile reservoir. And this is a good thing. You want to know the show from the mountains, to go up and enjoy the mountains and to stay in a place like this with 100 people because you do not want them dispersed camping all over higgledy piggledy. These kind of places, they're dry, warm, and safe. They have toilets. They have fire pits. They got things to do. They're safe. And at night, they step outside. They have a fire going. They look up. They see the Milky Way. And they have a really great experience. And that's why you want campgrounds like this. And it's a great place to put your family. They'll be dry, warm, and safe. You don't always have to camp out of the back of your truck. So 11 mile reservoir can sometimes look really placid. And most, look at all these species they have there. Rainbow, cutthroat, cut bow, brown trout, pike, perch, kokanee, and carp. There's a lot of motorized activity on uh, 11 mile, but it tends to be in the deeper parts over here and up in this area. They're not allowed to go around the islands here. And so these are great places to go out in a belly boat or a pontoon boat. You can also hike back here or take a canoe back here. There's dispersed camping in these areas. You have to get a permit and pay for that. But this is kind of wild land back there. So 11 mile reservoir is a really good place to take people and they will have a wide variety of things to do. My personal favorites for fishing there are chair fishing. It's a great place to set up a lawn chair I like wade fishing the shallows, or I like to float near these islands. I don't like being out there in the motorized boat because it's too much like a rock concert. And I love using a crayfish pattern there because they're so crazy and cuckoo and stupid, aren't they? Look, I mean, a crayfish, they have on a slow retrieve, crayfish swim backwards 
and then they take a break, takes like, and then they swim backwards. So they have that scallop kind of retrieve. And I think that kind of retrieve is, is fun to emulate. So I like fishing with a crayfish pattern. Now we're gonna move to spinning. Spinny Reservoir um, has a great inlet. It's actually last year, Spinny Reservoir's inlet was given a gold medal status. If you are not familiar with gold matter, uh, gold medal, the state will designate a certain waters based on the numbers of fish that are over 14 inches in a square mile of water. And this inlet, this whole, um, maybe the first mile has been given a gold medal status. Spinny Reservoir has gold medal status. The dream stream flows out of it has gold medal status. This is great fishing, world-class fishing. Um, for I, I give it a lot of stars here because the fishing quality, it's not a good place for chair fishing. It's not a good place for people who don't fish. There's nothing for them to do if they don't fish and there's no camping. It's very typical of this scenario. This is spinny. Late afternoon thunderstorm show up after that wind has blown through and everybody's gone home and that's a great time to fish it. This is how you fish spinny. You just get in a floating boat and you kick yourself off. There's usually so many people on the windward side that we call it the checkerboard because it just looks like pieces of checkers sitting on a big board out there and the fish come around and everybody's catching fish and then nobody's catching fish and there are no small fish in spinny. They are all big fish. Uh, this is my belly boat. I like the belly boat. Now, some of these reservoirs are drinking water, so you cannot touch your skin to the water. A dog can't swim in the water. So I'm wearing a neoprene bodysuit in this. And I just love being in a belly boat like this because you're just bobbing in the water. And I love that sensation. Uh, there's also incredibly huge pike there. People like to go in spinny for the pike. This was actually caught from the bank. One of our guides caught it with a woolly booger without a wire lead. He just got it in the in the beak of this this animal. He was he saw the weight coming at him. He thought it was a dragon. And he dragged it up out of the weeds, and we all saw it. And we all run. We're just yelling back up! Back. He dragged it up in the bank. We're all jump on it. We're stabbing it and kicking it and beating it. We killed it. Sorry, yeah, we gotta kill it. Cause look at it. We did have its stuff though. So the bathymetry of Spinny Reservoir, and I've collected the bathymetry point data, and I do GIS, and I've made 3D models for these reservoirs. Spinny used to, um, this is the trace of the original river. It makes kind of a channel. And if you fish the dream stream, you probably haven't noticed that you walk out of the parking lot. You can't see the river. And then you got to walk down, and there's like two, three benches. So the river historically has made some, it's an entrenched river. And this far east side is very shallow. This is the dam. And to give you some idea of what it looks like in 3D, we've got a long, wide, shallow part of the basin in this really deep part. And the fish are not in this deep part. The fish are in the shallows because of the weeds. That's where the sun can grow weeds. And these coves here on the left, are um, where ancient creeks used to flow in that no longer flow in. We'll get back to that in a second. And also Spinny Reservoir flooded a ranch and there's a flooded train trestle, a flooded train track down there. Those are good spots. Some of these reservoirs, you can look up the historic topography and pick features and get yourself kind of eyeballed over where you think it is and try to prove to yourself that you did something smart and maybe you're gonna catch a nice fish cut of that. This is typically what fishing at Spinny is like. It's just you and your boat is quite, at, whereas 11 miles of rock concert, it's acoustic here. And this is just what a, a lot of it is, just gentlemen quietly fishing and catching a big fish and being satisfied with themselves. Now, my personal choice for um, fishing Spinny is I like wade fishing. I like to wade fish the inlet here. This is the Otero Pipeline brings water from the Arkansas River into South Park and it pours into Spinney right there. That water is owned by Aurora Reservoir. 80% of the water in this reservoir is comprised of Arkansas River water. Um, I'll talk about that more later. I like to motorize fish near the inlet because there's broken off weed beds in there and there's big trout in there. And there's also big pike in there. 
Landon Myers land is right here. He fishes, he fishes this inlet. We don't, we don't guide there because that man's on foot and um, he only has limited uh, permits area. We guide all of South Park. We don't step on his toes. And lately he's been uh, guiding the North Bay up here. Now, if you've ever seen people fish in a, what's it? That lake up in Nevada where they got the Humboldt trout and you climb ladders, it's Pyramid Lake. This is the exact same setting. And I want to take a ladder out there and be the first. I don't see why not because it's it's a broad, shallow shelf and there's big fish out there. And you get like chest deep and you can still go. And if I had a ladder, I could see further. I could cast further and do it. I'm not going to do it this year. Maybe I'll do it next year. All right. My favorite pattern for spinny is an ice cream cone. It's a coronamid. The only thing you have to do with spinny is figure out the depth. Depth is critical. You just keep adjusting your strike indicator till you find the depth they're feeding at. It changes all the time. Once you've zeroed in on the depth, that's it. You're just sitting there catching fish all day. Ontario Reservoir. We're going to jump to that and blow through a few of these. Every time I think of a reservoir, I think of the inlet and the tailwaters. So the inlet is the south fork of the South Platte, as is the tailwaters. Historically, there were seven springs that were flooded when they built this dam. So ice vision is a real big thing there. And what you do is you take a historical topo map and you walk out here and you set up your hut over where one of those seven springs are. And that's where the fish are. There's my big secret. You can have it because I ain't going to go out there anymore because oddly, the um, Ontario Reservoir is like a harmonic convergence for low temperatures. The record lowest temperature in the lower conterminous United States was four years ago at Ontario Reservoir, negative 56 degrees. That is not wind chill. That was the, and for some reason in this area, uh, and I, I could digress, but um, I don't know what they buried there. So Ontario Reservoir has uh, stars for floatability. There's not a lot of uh, motorized craft. It's kind of a shallow reservoir. You can kick out anywhere and just, be kind of static in your boat and you'll see fish porpoising out there. They're real easy to catch. You cast, you see them rise here. You got to figure out what direction are they moving? You don't cast where you saw them rise. You wait to see them rise again. If they rose here, then you cast over there. If they rose here, then you cast over there because they're slowly moseying. at them. And they're real generous. You don't have to be real clever to catch very big fish in Ontario. This is uh, the South Fork coming out of Rough and Tumbling Creek. I spoke with somebody here who fished Rough and Tumbling Creek, but uh, it goes through Knight Imler and 63 Ranch, and it flows into Ontario. All of this is public access. In the fall, the big browns move up into here. We don't like to target spawning fish, but... There are pre-spawn and post-spawn large brown trout, and I'm talking like 20-inch brown trout in this water that has no riparian habitat. It is kind of a phenomenon there. The state record cut bow was landed at Ontario. This was during my lifetime, like when I had my tumbling trout fly shop. There are no little fish in Ontario. This is a very typical size. I guess they must stock big hens. She doesn't have a nubby fin. Usually when the, they'll clip the fin on a big hen when they let them out of the hitch. If you didn't know that, they will clip a fin on a hen to designate that that's a stock trout. But all the fish are big like that, real healthy, beautiful fish. Now this woman, Shirley, she's our carpenter chick up in Lake George. This is her first fish he ever caught. And uh, we took her out in Ontario, and she's, she thinks that that's what it is. You catch fish like this, and my husband in the back, because he did not catch a big fish up that dug. So Ontario, my personal choice is, I, whoop, I like wade fishing the shallows and inflatables near the shore. I don't like to get way out there in the middle. I mean, I am a Colorado girl. I don't like being way out at sea. So Ontario... Uh, calabatus and things that look like calabatus. Calabatus have a thorax, a head, and a tail. Um, Copper johns look like calabatus. This is an emerging calabatus. Let's jump to terial. 
Terriol, the biggest thing about Terra that I love that people don't know, everything's free. Free boat ramp, free camping, toilets, fire pits. It's just first come, first serve. It's very well maintained. They heavily stock it with um, cut bows, sometimes steel bows. There's a lot of fish just popping on the surface like popcorn. I take my mother here, except that it has a rocky pier there and she fell in and it's a long story. We're not, we're not taking her back there anymore. But Imperial Reservoir has a lot of stars. The headwaters that flow into it are excellent fishing. It's downstream of a corporate hay field. They're putting up hay right now, which just means grasshoppers. The grasshoppers, they move out of the hay field when they're haying and they go to where the river is because the, uh, the grass is tall there and the wind blows them in the river. All you got to do is like pull the hopper pattern over the water. They'll try to just jump out of the water, take that right out of your hand. And yeah, they will. So um, that's the headwaters. And in the tailwaters, the spillway, there's three spillways in South Park. Of course, 11 Mile Canyon is a spillway. That uh, Dream Stream is a spillway. And the spillway at Terriol Reservoir, they never freeze. You can dry fly fish all winter long. You might be freezing to death, especially at uh, Terriol. It's a little higher elevation. But I go out there because big rainbows are there. They're sipping. I like dry fly fishing in the winter. I love it. And it, that's a beautiful place to dry fly fish. And this is what Terriol Reservoir looks like. When we're guiding people in pontoon boats at Terriol, they don't have to know nothing. I just put a life vest on them. Put them in the boat, put my foot on them, and push them out in the water. Watch them float off. We tell you know, they sort of figured out they've got some oars, they have some flippers in their feet. They get too far. I mean, sometimes you get a character, he just like keeps going. He just keeps going out there. And you like, so I'm I'm pretty good on the sticks and I'll roll out to the guys or wig on. I have a dog leash on my pontoon and I clip it onto them and I roll them back where they're supposed to be. But people catch fish all over and they like, mostly when you take people who've never been in a pontoon, but they just like paddling around. Fishing comes second. They really just want to paddle around. First fish, it's a little dink, but she's happy at first fish and she's loving rolling around. First fish is an important fish. This is what Terriol is mostly like. It has very big browns, which is nice. You can wade fish it quite easily. As I said, it was stocked. There are pike in there as well. And my personal choice is chair sitting or going out in an inflatable boat. For patterns, anything that's bushy, stimulators, that's a rubby legged stimulator, that's a chubby, that's just a hairy pheasant tail. And that, this is the stupidest fly in the world, isn't it? Is that the stupid, who invented who said? Take your mop, honey. Can I have a piece of your mop? Really? I, I don't even keep them in my fly box. I guess they're emulating the, a grub or maybe a, what are those? Um, yeah, but in any case, uh, I think they're real dumb, so I don't fish with them. I don't even have them in my boxes. I'm a little bit embarrassed, but they work well. A lot of, if you have these, you might have San Juan worms, and I also don't streamer fish because I like to see the fish take my fly. Anyway, we could digress. I'm not going to digress. Let's move up to Fair Play Beach. This is an awesome place. Most people don't know about Fair Play Beach because if you're driving from Hartzell, you come to a T intersection, you have to drive up to the stoplight to get to downtown Fair Play. You cannot see that reservoir. If you're coming from Denver over Kenosha Pass, there's that stoplight. There's a grocery store. You go in here to see Fair Play. You cannot see this beach. If you're driving from this way, there's a little bitty sign about as well, maybe maybe big as my laptop, and it says Fair Play Beach. Very small, discreet sign. You turn, and the road you still can't see Fair Play Beach, and it looks like it's going through some people's yards and houses. And you're like, where is the reservoir? And then there's a dirt road that drops down. You still can't see Fair Play Beach. Well, you take your faith and you drop down there. Then you can see Fair Play Beach. Because you can see the middle fork of the South Platte. But you can't see the beach until you are upon it. And Fair Play Beach is wonderful, except there's no, uh, you, you can only wade fish it. It's excellent wade fishing. Um, the headwater should have a star here. The middle fork flows into it. 
and the middle fork flows out of it. And I love, I'm going to be guiding there tomorrow, seven o'clock in the morning, actually. Some people want to learn Tinkara. This is what uh, this reservoir looks like. This is the inlet. There's another one over here. And they make a delta that's about knee high that goes out to the middle, middle. But between the delta and the bank, there's a deep trough. You can walk way out into the lake, oh, maybe about 100 feet. And then there's drop-offs. And if you're with a guide, they'll stop you. Because, I mean, there's a color change. Some people don't know what that color change means. It's a steep drop-off. There's troughs and steep drop-offs. And there are lots of fish. When I was guiding this lady. I was guiding a group of ladies. They arrived at Fair Play Beach, set up a bunch of food. They set up a bar. Then they put on their water. They had music. And uh, we were fishing, like six of them were fishing. Her feet were stuck in the silt. She had a fish on the whole time. And when she released that fish, this is what that fish did. He just, he sank behind her feet here and he hung out and he thought real hard about what happened to him. His feelings were hurt. Be careful not to step on the fish. Fair Play Beach, my personal choice is wade fishing the shelf or sitting in a chair. If I'm with people who have mobility issues, I definitely take them here. There's uh, picnic tables, toilets. There's a covered pavilion if it's raining. It's a great place to take people. They can use bait. They can keep fish. But it's a fly fishing wonderful experience and also take advantage of uh, the river that flows in and out of it. And I like using big bushy patterns. And if you have a point fly dropper, any kind of a merger. And I give them a class of cast their fly out there and we wait and then they do super slow retrieve. Sometimes like if it's hopper, I just teach them like lower their tip and give it what I call a dink where they just like dink, dink, you know, and they make the hopper have like a little spasm and just do a slow retrieve. And what the slow retrieve does is it causes the merger to lift up in the water a little ways and emergers truly move this fast. And when they hit the surface, they stop immediately. Their wings curl out, stand up. They step out of their stuck and they fly off. And that is the speed at which they do this. And I will enforce to you that when you see a big hatch going on, like right now, the big trico hatch, Trout cannot eat bugs in the sky. They can only eat them when they're emerging, when they're stuck to the water or crippled, or after they have fallen to the water, when the spinners have fallen. It's the only time a trout can eat an aquatic insect. So when you see a hatch and you're not catching fish with the adult on the water, just try sinking, sinking adult. Let it be in the top foot of the water column or use emergers or wait until the spinner fall and then they'll gobble up anything. Anyway, Montgomery Reservoir, oh, let's jump to that. So if you are ever driving through South Park from Fair Play, you're going to go over to Breckenridge. Don't go to Breckenridge. Stop. Because on this side, all the water's going into the Atlantic Ocean. You pop over Breckenridge, all that Water's going to the Pacific Ocean. Don't, don't be playing in that nasty Pacific Ocean water. Montgomery Reservoir, 90% of the water in Montgomery Reservoir is piped over from the western slope. It's piped over from the Blue River. The middle fork of the South Platte would not have any of the volume that it has if this water wasn't being uh, coming out of Montgomery Reservoir, 90% of which is piped over from water that would be going into the Colorado River. So Montgomery Reservoir, I give it stars because the tailwater is the middle fork of the South Platte. It's astronomically gorgeous from the minute it comes out of Montgomery Reservoir all the way down to its confluence, confluence with the South Fork in the vicinity of Hartzell. Uh, you cannot touch the water, you cannot get in the water chair fishing and wade fishing somewhat because I'll show you how steep it is. It's really hard to wade fish there. Hiking is excellent. This is a great place to go with people who um, are visiting. 
They want to see some high country. They want to see something gorgeous. They do not fish. They're not athletic. They're not going to go on a hike. This is a great place to take them because it's stunning. This is what it looks like. Um, it's a, do you see the shape of this? Glaciers were sitting here and they, they were moving down this valley that's called a hanging valley. And the big lump of ice sat here. And as it melted, it rotate and it skewered in and made a big hole there. And that's called a tarn. A tarn is a, it kind of looks like a lake, but there's no springs and there's no feeder uh, rivers that go into it. It's just collecting rain mountain precipitation in a glacial bowl. So Montgomery Reservoir was a tarn. It's a pretty high elevation. The water from Montgomery Reservoir goes by pipe to Pikes Peak. What? What? There's pipe that comes out of Montgomery Reservoir and it goes through South Park. Okay, that's downhill. I got it. How's it go to Pikes Peak? It actually, there's so much volume and weight in the pipe between Montgomery Reservoir and Divide, Colorado. The first pumping station is in Divide, Colorado. That's the first place that they put more pressure on it to pump it. And Divide, Colorado is actually not that much lower than Catamount Reservoir, which is the building of this water that comes out of Montgomery Reservoir. Bizarre little facts, I'm full of that. I'm so boring at Thanksgiving. So I put check marks here, places to fish at uh, Montgomery. You can fish near the tunnel. You can fish at this parking lot. And there's um, a trailhead here. You can fish there, the very steep, and you can fish the tailwaters, the spillway. You cannot even walk. You, you can't even look. You can't even look in that side of the bank. They will, the police will come. You'll be busted for look at this. They got so many signs up about do not walk. I got letters over there. Is they they got something over there that's like um, I don't know Noah or is something really important over there? This is what it looks like. Uh, we got this footage from a Chinese balloon. We haven't heard from him in a while. That was Montgomery Reservoir, my little choice of chair sitting or wade fishing. And a phenomenon with high country lakes, including high country beaver ponds and tarns is terrestrials from down lower. And the reason is, if you've ever been on a big river like the Colorado River, the Arkansas, or even a, the Green River, at the end of the day, the wind blows up the river. And that's because the hot air all day is changing places with the air from the upper elevations they switch places and the hot air goes blowing like crazy you can put in where you took out if you're on the colorado river in the wrong place and so this phenomenon is it blows terrestrials up the mountain and those trout in those high country lakes know what even if you're above timberline they know what a grasshopper is they know what an ant is so those critters get blown up there in enough numbers that is very profitable to use those. I do like using a dropper sometimes. I mean, if I'm up in these high country lakes and I'm not catching them with just one fly and I put on a dropper, it's not a very good day. And I will not be nymphing or streamer fishing because then something's gone wrong if I'm having to do that. All right, Jefferson Reservoir, let's jump over there. It's a really beautiful place. This is the town of Jefferson. You drive, well, there's nothing there. I guess they opened up a burger place, but they're not typical of a mountain cafe. They're post their hours, but not be there when they say they're going to be there. That's that's the mountain restaurant. So from Jefferson, you can head towards Jefferson Lake. It's well marked. And when Jefferson Lake is very high, towards it to Jefferson Creek. And if you're going to fly fish that reservoir, you'd be thinking, what's the inlet like? What's the tailwater like? The headwaters are horrible. The inlet that flows into Jefferson, it's just paltry, and there's no fish up there. It's real shallow. The tailwaters are excellent. You can just fish Jefferson Creek and the beaver ponds. It's a pretty nice creek. I'll show you some uh, video of that. Many times I just prefer to fish the creek or guide the creek, and we don't even make it up to the lake. But the reason we go to the lake is that the lake is astronomically gorgeous, and they have lake trout in there. 
this is what the lake looks like. It's hard to wade fish because see how steep it is? And when the water's placid, you get that kind of post guard that is mirroring, mirroring exactly the mountain. It's just, uh, I've been out here in an inflatable boat when it's placid and the image of the mountain around you and the sky, you get this odd sensation that you're floating in the sky. It's very, very cool. This is what the tailwaters look like. It's a decent creek, lots of beaver pond. Don't you want to fish that? That's exactly what you want to fish. If you're like me, I'd fish that. So these dead trees here, I kept all these little creeks. I kept seeing like dead trees along these creeks. It's like, why are these trees dead? And a forest ranger, Smokey the forest ranger told me that beavers run the trees. They eat the bark around the trees. And then when the trees die and fall over, the beavers grab those ranches and make their dams. They're eating the live little trees, the saplings and the willows, but they're just waiting for the big trees to die because that's what they use as building material. So when you're along these little creeks and you see all these dead trees, you'd be looking for some beaver ponds. Here's a beaver pond. Now, if you do not see a moose on your way to Jefferson, you are driving too fast. Slow down. There's a lot of moose there. So if you haven't seen a moose, go there and drive slowly. You will see Bullwinkle. Um, the species are definitely worth going there and not hard to catch. Lake trout, big silvery fish, rainbow Colorado River cutthroat. I've been stalked there. Cut bows, brown trout, brook trout. You can have a grand slam there is another reason I take people there. love getting a grand slam. So for Jefferson Reservoir, my personal choice is chair sitting. There's a cement ramp that goes down. It's a nice incline, but it has a gate across it. No motorized fishing, but you can drag your boats down there really easily. And it kind of flattens out. And then that whole cove is flat enough to set elderly people or people with mobility issues or kids up. They're not going to fall in and drown there. My favorite flies are just tooling around or slowly stripping in streamers. These are um, mayor's mini leeches or just woolly boogers. Cast them out, they're slowly stripping them in. The, the trout, there's a lot of them and they're right along the banks, all the banks, even the lake trout are just picking up streamers. So there's actually an eighth reservoir and that is Wild Horse Reservoir. You've probably heard about it. Who's heard about Wild Horse Reservoir? Oh, come on. So the city of Aurora, is going to build a new reservoir. It is approved. It's gonna, it'll be in um go with your opening. Ah, the late 2020s. So the pipeline that currently feeds spinny right here, they're gonna divert it and put a larger, deeper reservoir here called uh, the Wild Horse Reservoir. It's holding their water because I don't, I'm not going to digress too much. They're not increasing how much water they're allowed. They're just holding it. And then they're going to make a new pipeline. They're not sure if the new pipeline is going to enter the river or enter Spinney here or enter Spinney here. It's called Wild Horse Reservoir. And those, that's my presentation. I did bring some, um, what? I brought some of my books here. Most of you have heard of my books. So I have fishing atlases. This book, if, you, if it's free and it's public access in South Park, but it's not the Dream Stream and it's not 11 Mile Canyon, it's in here. It includes maps, the roads, pictures of what it looks like. If it's above 9,000 feet elevation in the Mosquito Range and you can drive to it in a Subaru without hiking and without four wheel drive, it's in this book. And this book is probably my favorite because it says, you know, once you get here in your car, you can start fishing, but if you want to hike a mile, there's another lake. Or you can start fishing here, but if you want a four-wheel drive in another mile, there's another lake. So it, it puts information like that in it. And Joe the Schmo is my fishing methodologies book about what's happening under the water, what the fish are doing, how they see, how they feed, what the aquatic insects are doing in the water, how they move what the aquatic insects, how they live and how they die. 
and what your flies are doing when you change something simple, like move your split shot up the leader or move your split shot closer to the fly. What happens to your flies under the water when you make some changes in your rigging. And that is my Joe the Schmo book. And that's my talk. And thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it very much. Do we have any questions for Michelle? Yes. The books are up here in front. There you are for sale. She takes the uh, cash credit. She takes uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> no, no fractions of a Bitcoin. You have to give her the full one, you know?